Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum, being filmed on Wednesday, June the 25th in the Memorial Arena in Victoria. I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff who make it all happen. And we're very lucky today to have as our guest Elizabeth May, the leader of the Green Party of Canada and our Green Member of Parliament. Uh, for Saanich and the Gulf Island? Island. Saanich and the Gulf Islands. Yeah. So Elizabeth, we, we've got a few things to talk about, but let's start with uh, democracy. It's a good place to start. Okay. <laughs> it needs a lot of work. You know, of work. I, I, people are often uh, assume that because what they see on television of Parliament is sort of aggressive and uh, nasty, basically being question period, that I must hate my job because how can you stand it? But actually, I love my job and it's wonderful most of the time. Question period is my least favorite part of the day. But it's very clear as a parliamentarian that the institutions and the traditions of parliamentary democracy are under assault and that we are losing the effect of democracy that, that uh, is the lifeblood of, of, well, of any democracy. And that's uh, increasingly I'm aware that it's because of the power of political parties. Not just one political party, not just one political leader, but over time this non-constitutional, not that it's illegal, but political parties are not mentioned in our constitution. They're not an essential part of Westminster parliamentary democracy, not at all. And I suppose I'd have to say that if I could, if I could be inventing democracy in Canada from scratch, I would not have invented political parties. Uh, but they're here and we can't, I mean, I, even if it meant losing the Green Party that I love, if I could get a magic wand and get rid of all political parties, I think that would be a good blow for democracy. But that said, the reason that political parties are getting increasing levels of power is that I think, I think we're sort of letting it happen by accident. We looked south of the border of the United States, which is a very different system. It's a presidential system. They directly elect their president. The name Barack Obama was on the ballot. People got to, you know, Stephen Harper's name was on exactly one set of ballots in Canada. People who were voters in Calgary Southwest. My name was on the ballot only in Saanich Gulf Islands. We're a Westminster parliamentary democracy. And in our system of government, in principle, all members of parliament are equal and the Prime Minister is to report to Parliament, not the other way around. So we've, we've allowed political parties to get more and more power and the leaders of those parties to get more and more power. And so the, the ultimate uh, real uh, threat to democracy is the power wielded now by the Prime Minister's office. So there is a way to fix these problems and to reduce the power of political parties and reestablish the individual rights and powers and privileges and responsibilities of each member of parliament to work for their constituents and not for a political party. And that, that's where we have to start. Okay, so I mean, I agree with you 100%. It's one of the biggest problems we have is that the political parties are run essentially by the party leader and the small group of people who are his or her friends. How, how do we start to weaken that power and increase the power of the people we elect right. to represent what we want. Well, the, fortunately there is right now before the House of Commons, it's coming up for debate this fall, um, a private member's bill by a conservative member of parliament named Michael Chong. Uh, he is the member for Wellington Halton Hills. And you know, Michael as an individual is an, is, an, is an interesting example of an MP who's doing something on his own. He's part of the conservative caucus for sure. But he represents ideologically a very different brand of conservatism than Stephen Harper. And anyway, Michael Chong is a, like, uh, as I am, a passionate believer in Westminster parliamentary democracy. So he's put forward a bill, C559, and it would do something very critical. It would remove the requirement for the leader of a political party to sign the nomination papers for every candidate. This is something that was changed in the Elections Act in the late 60s, first affected an election in the early 70s. And putting the leader's signature on every nomination form gives the leader the power to say, I'm not signing your nomination form. Right. And it's the first and only really legal cudgel that a leader of a party can use to keep existing MPs or you know, future hopeful candidate MPs, to keep them uh, disciplined is the ultimate threat is I won't sign your nomination papers. So in other words, if you know, in, in the many, many months that uh, uh, a parliamentarian is, is there, if any parliamentarian dares to stand against the leader of the party on any important issue or rub them the wrong way, 
the, the party leader can just say, I'm not going to sign your papers and your career is basically over. Yeah, the party leader, I often get asked, what are the, what, why do so many MPs toe the line for their party? Why do they do what they're told? Why don't they stand up for what they believe in? And I don't think the average Canadian understands exactly how effective these threats and sanctions and punishments can be. So the first thing that can happen is that a prime minister or leader of a party can say, we're throwing you out of caucus. That's right. You're now sitting, you may have been elected with us as a conservative or an NDP, or since I was elected to parliament actually, now I can tell you there's been a Bloc Québécois, a conser several conservatives, and an NDP -er thrown out of caucus by their leader office because of some offense or other. So that's, that's very effective. You're suddenly, you're elected as an NDP -er and suddenly you're sitting as an independent. Well, you know right away you're going to have very, a very big, big problem getting reelected. And you have to hope that that expulsion is temporary. The threat around the nomination papers is something that was an accident historically. I believe it was an accident. Up until the late 1960s, our ballots, when we went to vote as Canadians, and I was too young to remember when this was actually the case, but you go to vote, and it would be the name of the candidate, every candidate's name, but their political party affiliation wasn't listed wasn't on the ballot at all. And when they decided, okay, Canada's population is growing, not everybody knows that Elizabeth May's Green Party or whatever, we're going to, by law, require that the name of the party is next to that person's name on the ballot. And then they, at Elections Canada, figured, okay, wait a minute, how are we going to know that the person who comes forward and says, okay, I'm here to represent the Liberal Party, how do we know they really do? So they put in this, this just as a, as a double check, make sure this person's on the up and up, the leader's signature is required on your nomination forms. And they accidentally created a monster where the leader has powers to threaten and sanction. There's other threats, by the way, and other sanctions. Leaders of parties can take their MPs and say, okay, you, you stepped out of line, you're not allowed to ask any questions in question period, you're not allowed to speak in the parliament, you're not allowed to be on any committees, you're not allowed to travel. There's, there's various, and if you're a member of parliament and you're not allowed to speak in parliament because your own party is punishing you, well, your own voters may never know that's the reason you're not speaking, but you don't look very effective. I mean, these, these, are, these are serious threats, and that's what makes members of parliament in other parties, when their leader says jump, they say how high. And the Michael Chong's bill represents a real opportunity because it's being put forward by a conservative, he's got lots of support, Oh, by the way, his bill does a few other interesting things. One is to say that the parliamentary caucus of a party, the MPs elected with that party, will have the ability under Michael Chong's bill to institute a leadership review. Yes, very important, yeah. very important. So, you know, every other parliamentary democracy, <clears throat> like Margaret Thatcher was deposed, not by the voters of the UK, but her own caucus decided that enough of the Iron Lady. Or, or in Australia recently, we've had two examples where Julia Gillard deposed Kevin Rudd, and then Kevin Rudd came back and deposed Julia Gillard. People may not, you know, that's how Westminster parliamentary democracies are supposed to work. That's right, that's how it's supposed to work. And, and it, the rules never changed in Canada, but what happened is as those political party leaders got more and more and more power, and as our media morphed itself into pretending they were covering presidential elections, where it's all about the leaders, it got to where they forgot, and a lot of Canadians in some ways never knew, wait a minute, these, the, this excessive power, this sort of imperial style prime minister isn't our system of government at all. So it, with Michael Chong's Bill 559, I'm really hoping it will pass. I'm mentioning it, you know, wherever you live, uh, well, if you're, if you're in Saanich Gulf Islands, you know that I'm voting for this bill. But for the NDP members for Southern Vancouver Island or the Conservative members further up island, it's going to be a free vote. And it's really important for people to let their MP know we're watching you on this. We want to see you vote in favor of Michael Chong's Bill 559 when it comes up because it's the most important step, uh, second only to getting rid of first past the post and moving to proportional representation. This bill has a real chance of passing which is, you know, extraordinary. It, by the way, it wouldn't take effect till after the next election. So that's why the Conservatives aren't so frightened of Stephen Harper's reaction personally right now. But Michael Chong is taking something forward that's meaningful democratic reform. And I, I don't think it's gotten quite enough press attention. So I'm grateful that you gave me a chance to, to explain it because I think breaking down the power of leaders' offices is critical. And of course, I'm a leader of a party, so you might think, well, 
Well, but I'm really leader of a party that doesn't think leaders should have power, and the Green Party doesn't think I should either, so they've already taken steps in our bylaws. I can't say I won't sign your nomination papers. Right. If I take that step, I need to get the Federal Council of the Green Party to support me with, I think it's two-thirds. I mean, it doesn't really... It, it, and that makes sense, yeah. because you don't want someone to be running for the Green Party of Canada who, just because they were chosen by a very small associ yeah. riding association in some, some town or city, but they're antithetical yeah. to really what the Green Party believes in, there has to be a way of controlling it, but it shouldn't be the party leader. It no, just gives them too much power. Certifying the names on the ballots under Michael Chong's bill would be local people from the local party who would make that statement of this is okay with us, this is how it's working, this is how it's going forward. So I think, you know, we, we, we need to reduce the power of leaders' offices and specifically the Prime Minister's office. It's now, in recent years, it's been as much as $10 million a year. It's entirely partisan. It does nothing but run a shop. I, sometimes people call it the fear factory. It's all about trying to re-elect uh, the Conservatives under Stephen Harper. The PMO under Liberals was all about trying to re-elect Liberals. These are not civil service positions. These are essentially henchmen and henchwomen. I mean, they are yeah. political operators. And they've now, PMO has gotten so overpowerful that it's actually, you know, when we talk about gagging scientists, who's doing the gagging of scientists? People in PMO. Uh, who's telling MPs they can't speak? People in PMO. Who's actually telling bureaucrats in Environment Canada or Transport Canada, we want a report that says pipelines and tankers are okay. You write us that report. And I can tell when I'm reading them that, that they're trying to create, you know, reports from the civil service were never supposed to be biased reports to meet a political agenda. They're supposed to be, by definition, nonpartisan, fact-based productions of the government of Canada. And it grieves me to tell you that you can no longer believe reports that come out that with the imprint Government of Canada as a factual basis for decision making because it's all torqued by the spin doctors out of PMO. Yeah, and just think of how dangerous that is for this country when a small group of two-bit nobodies mm -hmm. runs the civil service yeah. and controls our parliament. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. Fun, there's nothing more fundamentally important than what we've just yeah. been talking about here. But people don't know it because it's never mentioned. Yeah, and, the, and I think this is a place where it's very sad, too, that our mainstream media has been turning a blind eye to this. It may sound so dry and boring. I mean, it is hard to explain. Well, there's something called the Privy Council Office, and it's like the Deputy Minister's Office to the Prime Minister's Office, and it, it's supposed to control a nonpartisan professional civil service which has merit-based promotions and is not about selling an agenda. It's about providing empirically sound information. The political side doesn't have to accept it. And the bureaucratic side has to implement policies that are the political side's decision. What we've never had happen before is the political side telling the civil service side, we want you to manufacture the evidence. Um, Kevin Page, who's one of my, my respect so deeply, who was our first parliamentary budget officer, spoke at UVic at a Green Party event and said, you know, every single institution of Westminster parliamentary democracy is under assault. Now that's a remarkably strong statement to come from someone from, again, a nonpartisan professional background in fiscal policy, because the budget exercise is also politicized. Um, I've been saying for a while now, we shouldn't refer to the budget when it comes out in spring. You know, it always is around March, there's all the, you know, drum roll, and here it is, the federal budget. And uh, I think the mainstream media has been letting Canadians down by failing to tell them that the budget no longer contains a budget. It doesn't actually have anything like a budget. It doesn't have a statement of total uh, revenue, it doesn't have a statement of total expenses, and it doesn't have a bottom line. I, I think we should call it the annual thick brochure very thick brochure. The annual thick brochure has some numbers scattered in it, but they don't, they don't run up and down in columns. There's nothing you can compare to the previous year. We used to get budgets when I used to read them. I'd go to the Environment Canada page or the, the International Development Agency when we had CETA or whatever, and you'd, you'd be able to look at the individual budget by department and say, oh, okay, it's down from last year. Because it would run with a comparison to the year before it would run two or three years out, and you could say, oh, okay, there's cuts coming to this line item. Uh, they've buried where the cuts are. 
and they buried where the cuts are. They buried them so deep that Kevin Page actually went to court to say, I need to see, as parliamentary budget officer, I need to answer questions to members of parliament. Members of parliament want to know, with the budget cuts we saw last year, where has the axe fallen? What's happened to critical services for Canadians? The deputy ministers, on instructions from the Privy Council office, on instructions from the Prime Minister's office, refused to turn this information over to the Parliamentary Budget Office. He went to court. The federal court said this is information that all members of Parliament are entitled to have. And the Parliamentary Budget Officer is entitled to have this information. You know, and that was more than a year and a half ago. We still don't have that information. They still refuse to turn it over. So we're, we're really in trouble in Canada when this can be going on. And again, what's in the daily paper is, well, it, you know, the stories about Nigel Wright and the $80,000 check for Mike Duffy and all those things actually do matter. Those are significant uh, scandals. But they pale in comparison to the question of who's really running this country. And if it's, if it's solely the prime minister's office, what happens when the next prime minister gets in? Is that going to be okay that Trudeau or Mulcair have the same total power with all the levers to control everything? in one neat console found on the Prime Minister's desk. I mean, that, that, an elected dictatorship, is dangerous. And our system of government is not to have an elected dictator. Because you know, it's, it's, we're supposed to be having a parliament that takes you know, not necessarily total consensus, but most important political reforms and political moves in previous governments required something of a political consensus going forward. And what we have now is not only excessive power in the Prime Minister's office, and I'm sorry I'm kind of running on a bit, but what's ha one of the things that fuels this is that political parties, again, because of their power, are running what goes on in Parliament. And so it's an extension of political campaigning instead of what we used to do, which is set aside the partisanship of campaigning at least a bit and work. <laughs> and in between elections, you, got, you had something called Parliament, where parliamentarians would often cooperate across party lines to bring about good public policy. Yeah, good public policy. That's what it's supposed to be all about. But it can't happen anymore. Well, not if you're in a constant state of hyper-partisan battle. So that's where, that's where I love my, this is one of the reasons I love Parliament, is I'm in a lot of ways above the fray. Because as a Green, and now that there's Bruce Heyer and me as two Green Party MPs, we assess what evidence, we think about what we were going to do for our own constituents. We don't have to report to any boss except our own constituents. We don't always vote the same way on bills. We're looking forward to the day that we have enough green MPs in there that we can, I don't want to use the word force, entice the other parties to cooperate. Because once we have critical mass, we can get the other parties to agree, let's, 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 stop, being, let's stop this silliness and figure out how we work together to get the best possible policy, the best possible bill, the best possible climate policy, which is, for me, the most urgent thing currently being ignored, is a, a, to have a strong climate policy in Canada. Well, let's talk about climate policy, but as we're talking about it, everybody should keep in mind that the reason we don't have any good climate policy is exactly what you've just been saying for the last 10 minutes, that we don't have a parliament anymore. We have an elected dictatorship, and that dictator, Stephen Harper, doesn't even try to work for us. He works for somebody else. Yeah, I, and I'm not sure what drives him or motivates him, but it's very clear that he's been from as long as I've known him, and I've known him since he first became elected in the Reform Party, and then when he was with the uh, Alliance and on to forming the it wasn't really a merger, it was more of a hostile takeover of progressive conservatives. Uh, Stephen Harper has been consistent in his uh, deep antipathy to doing anything about climate. He opposed the Kyoto Protocol when it was first proposed. He voted against the Kyoto Protocol for ratification when it passed through the House of Commons. He's, for his first steps as Prime Minister really were to remove climate science from the Environment Canada webpage and spring 2006 announced that Canada no longer felt obliged to comply with a legally binding treaty. It took him some additional years to withdraw us from that treaty. So not to go through all the things Harper has done to destroy climate policy, including canceling all the climate plans that were in place when he was elected, but he's not always consistent. On some things, he's made a 180 degree switch. You know, remember he, he boycotted China during the Olympics in Beijing as a statement about human rights. And then he signed a treaty with 
China to give Chinese state-owned enterprises the right to sue Canada if they don't like our laws. Now, fortunately, that treaty isn't ratified yet, but yes. that's just as an example. I mean, he doesn't always maintain a consistent position. He changed his mind on income trusts. He's changed his mind on a number of things over the years. But on climate policy, he remains absolutely firm in his desire to, do, to absolutely have Canada at the global level in negotiations, destroy efforts that move towards stronger treaties, and domestically we have no climate plan and our emissions are rising. How do you think most parliamentarians, including uh, the members of the Conservative Party, feel about what we're doing? Because, I mean, we're essentially uh, on the path to complete and total destruction. Yeah. So how, do, how does Parliament feel as separate from yeah. Prime Minister Harper? Well, I have to take it as parliamentarians as individuals, and in a lot of ways they reflect Canada. There are a handful, and I don't think it's more than a handful, who actually don't believe climate science. Uh, and sometimes they actually speak up and say such nonsense things. Uh, we formed, when I was first elected, one of the things I did was form an all-party climate caucus. So the conservative who sits on that, you might not be surprised by now, it's Michael Chong again, <laughs> the kind of person who'll step out for the pack and do the right thing. Uh, so he's the conservative on our all-party climate caucus executive, uh, Kirsty Duncan, who's a liberal from Etobicoke, who used to be an IPCC scientist. Uh, we've had a number of different uh, NDP members. It used to be Denise Savoie when we first set it up. Uh, now it's a lovely young uh, Quebecois NDP named Francois Chaquette and a Bloc Quebecois member, Jean-Francois Fortin. So it literally is an all-party climate caucus, and we host events to educate other MPs. We, uh, I organized one just earlier in June on Arctic climate science, and we heard from uh, a number of scientists who are talking about what it means to lose permafrost in terms of positive feedback loops of releasing methane, and also what it means to Inuit communities where they're losing the ground and they'll have to move houses and move, you know, won't be able to maintain roads and so on. So the average member of parliament, I'd say the majority by far, believe we should take climate action. And there's and this a is deep the level of frustration. Yeah, this is the danger of everything you've said, is that the majority of parliament wants to take climate action yeah. because that's what most Canadians want. But we're completely controlled by, by the dictator, yeah. uh, the prime minister. And also by the leaders of the other parties. So it depends on what's flavor of the day. I, I tried to convince the Liberals and the New Democrats because I thought it would be very effective. This is the first time I've told this story publicly, but I thought, wouldn't it be effective if on Earth Day of 2013, it happened to fall on a, April 22nd fell on a Monday, so question period. I thought, wouldn't it be great if every question from every opposition member that day was on climate policy? The Conservative members, even the ministers, are not allowed to go off script. They read their answers. Who and, gives them the answers? Well, the PMO. So they're reading office. something that is verbatim the same to every question. They may have a variety of, say, two or three verbatim scripts, but they're not allowed to veer from those scripts. If you can imagine an entire hour of question period within which the Minister of Environment, the Minister of Natural Resources have no answers to read out except the ones on cards they have to give them over and over and over again. I thought would it be a very powerful thing that we as opposition MPs could do if we united around something. And it's just so hard to get because of the party organizing. Again, the party leaders have too much power. Loads of MPs liked this idea when I talked to them about it. None of them could get their party to agree. This is the problem again. The Liberals and the NDP don't want to cooperate with each other. So Stephen Harper is allowed to get away with a lot more because on the opposition benches, the Liberals are trying to score points against the NDP. The NDP is trying to score points to make the Liberals look bad. And in that loss of opportunity, Canadians get let down. And I'm not blaming any individuals. It's a systemic problem. And to go back to why it's so bad, it also has to do with the first-past-the-post voting system. Totally. Because it informs a political strategist of the following thing. If you're a political strategist for the NDP, you know the biggest risk of your vote is that it will bleed to the Liberals because they'll be worried about how to stop Harper. If you're a liberal strategist, you worry more about the NDP because you think your vote isn't likely to go to Harper. It might bleed away if they think Tom will care's a better bet. So the, the specter of so-called strategic voting hangs over the heads of all the political strategists. So instead of working together as an opposition to really make it clear to Canadians and the national media how weak and awful and bad the conservative climate policies are, 
we let them get away with it because we don't have a, we don't have a coordinated strategy on FIPA, on climate, on pipelines, on unemployment insurance, on temporary foreign workers, you name it. If the opposition benches were willing to set aside partisanship for long enough to put together a coherent strategy and take that to question period, it would be a very different situation. I think Stephen Harper and his ministers would be quivering masses of weeping jelly by the end of one hour of trying to answer the same question with the same three talking points. So, I mean, it's kind of pathetic that our, our cabinet ministers are given lines they have to read by 25-year-olds, as they say. It's even more pathetic than that. They're required to show up over the lunch hour and do QP prep. So the NDP members who get to ask questions have to show up at question period preparation, QP prep. They have to show up and rehearse the way they ask the questions, and the conservatives show up to practice the way they're going to answer them. It's, it's, it's not parliament. It's, it's bad high school drama. Yeah. So a big part of the solution to this is to move to a proportional representation voting system. Is, that, is there any chance that's going to happen? I think it will happen inevitably in Canada. It will take a minority parliament. Uh, I'm hoping, as you can tell from the number, another answer I gave you, that at the end of the next election, I'm hoping that there are enough Green MPs that we have a balance of power so that we can say to a Liberal minority or an NDP minority or even a Conservative minority, are you willing to work with us to get rid of first past the post and bring in real climate policy? And if you are, we'll support you and we'll make sure that happens. We need to get, that's the way in which proportional representation will come in, will be because one of the larger parties that has the power to do it is ultimately held feet to the fire for something they really want right what's, away. What's the position of the Liberal Party and the NDP right now on proportional representation? The NDP has the best policy. I mean, well, I mean, like the Greens, we want to have proportional representation. We want to see it put in place soon. Uh, the, the Liberals have not yet accepted proportional representation. They've been willing, Justin Trudeau will accept some criticism of first past the post. But if anything leans towards preferential voting, he's unwilling to look at proportional representation. And the interesting thing about Harper is he once wrote a paper in favor of proportional representation when he was in university, but I asked him about it once. He said, oh, well, he said, Elizabeth, you'll find that members of parliament don't want to change the system of voting by which they were elected. Yeah, right. Pretty clever sentence, but uh, it, so obviously the conservatives don't favor proportional representation. That's how they got a false majority. But I, I don't like false majorities, even for progressive parties. The, the, um, the liberals in Ontario just got a false majority. And of That's course, right. I was very relieved that Tim Hudak of the Conservatives didn't get in in Ontario, but I don't think it's healthy for a democracy when, given how much our system of government is morphing towards a premier, it's the same things I've said about federal politics are also true about provincial politics. Premiers have too much power right now too. And MLAs and members of legislatives, legislatures at the provincial level should also be more a group of equals who work together on behalf of their constituents and set aside the partisan battles until we're back into an election. Well, these are the fundamentally important things that, that have got to, if we could change some of the things you've been talking about, I think this whole country would take some big steps in the right direction on all issues. I don't think we'd have the homeless roaming the streets. You know, our, our environmental laws from top to bottom would not be getting destroyed. Yeah. We'd be a better country. Well, and, and the good news, if I can, because I, I know I've been sounding very negative, I really can share for most anyone listening, the good news is that most members of Parliament are extremely decent people. If you had them in your home for dinner, you'd be glad to meet a new neighbor. They are civic-minded, community-spirited. They got into politics because they thought they were going to get elected and make a difference. And, and liberal, NDP, or conservative, they all get elected and then they get the lecture. Oh, my job is to do what I'm told, sit down when I'm told to sit down, shut up when I'm told to shut up, and read from this script. That's disillusioning for them. So I think that the message that if we can redress the imbalance and give members of parliament, the, the only thing in our constitution is members of parliament represent constituencies. Political parties aren't mentioned. The prime minister's office doesn't exist in our constitution. And I don't think it should exist in real life. It should just be the bare bones of an operation to support a prime minister doing that job which is to be first among equals. That's it. Not first among dictator. Equals, not dictator. Elizabeth, believe it or not, that was, uh, that was half an hour. We're oh, time. dear. I know. Thank you very much. <laughs> all the things we were going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, we talked about them all. <laughs> Good. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Nothing is more important than the, the democratic uh, improvements that Elizabeth was talking about.
Thank you.